Good morning, the congregations of Philadelphia, Taylor, and Unity United Methodist Churches. Thank you for welcoming them into your home today. Thank you once again for inviting us into your home, into your car, wherever you are, worshiping this, this day. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together, to share your word, to sing songs, to praise you, and Lord, to celebrate this time that is the where we recognize the birth of your church on that that day when you sent the Holy Spirit and it filled so many people and 3,000 people were one to you in one day. Lord, thank you so much for your church, for the comfort and the security that it has brought to me in my life and for many of those listening today. I pray, Lord, that as the mask mandates have been, have been lifted or are loosening up some, that we are beginning to feel a little bit more normal. And Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to be your servant. And I pray that each person who is listening this morning is also so thankful for the opportunity that they too are your servant. Thank you for, the, for bringing them here, Lord, so that we may celebrate you and your church together. Be with us now, Lord, as and hear our prayers as we lift up those that, um, those we know who are having a hard time of it right now. Whether it be physically, spiritually, emotionally, Lord, you are the great physician and the great healer. If there is anyone listening to this, Lord, I pray your blessings on them right now. I pray that you fill them with your Holy Spirit today and that they may really take away something from this lesson today. Be with us now, Lord, and hear our prayers as we pray that prayer Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
The scripture lesson this morning is from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 8 and 12 through 16. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And every one present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running and they were be bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be? they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in their own native languages. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? they asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, They're just drunk, that's all. Then Peter stepped forward with the eleven other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Fill each of us with your Holy Spirit, and may only your words be spoken and heard this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The time has come, and we in the church might as well face it. People have practically given up on us. They see the church as irrelevant. Church membership has fallen and attendance has. Oh, there are superstar preachers that still have over-the-top personalities and they bring thousands into their places of work, worship each week and they just pack them in. But overall, people in the United States just shrug when it comes to the questions of the church in today. In fact, they don't consider us worth the bother. Surveyors have found that um, when they knock on people's doors and ask questions, I'm assuming that when I read this they were talking about census surveyors, but when they knock on the door and they poll people about their religion, if they're Christian, when they, if they or even if they even say that they have a faith. Particularly the Christian, the ones who might say that they're Christian, when they're asked if they're Baptist, Methodist, Church of Christ, Lutheran, Catholic, Episcopalian, or none of the above, many, many, many are saying none of the above. And even if they include independent in there. The nuns, as we call them, as they're becoming known, have begun moving up in the polls. And there's another side to that. There are the duns. The nuns and the duns. The ones who have tried Christianity and there are church and they're just done with it. The nuns and the duns. But that's the title of our sermon today. None of the above. You know, offering praise to God and celebrating re the resurrection and supporting each other during times of crisis, digging more deeply into, into Scripture and receiving the body and blood of Christ and having communion together and finding hope in despair have just fallen out of favor. They're not in vogue anymore. None of the above beats that list of wonderful things that we have in the church. Before we hang our heads in resignation, though, let's play a game of connect the dots. In regular dot-to-dot -dot pictures, oh, I've got a dot-to-dot -dot book here, and this is inspirational dot-to-dot. -dot. In regular dot-to-dot -dot pictures, we don't know what the original picture looks like. But in our instance, 
we do. We have the picture um, right in front of us. And we are the last dot. If we trace back, if, you know, have you ever done a complicated dot to dot and you found the last one and traced backward? Well, that's what we're going to do for a moment. We're going to trace backward in our own dot to dot. If we look at it, we're the last dot. And if we trace back, then we would look at the history of our individual congregation. Us, we would just put our, we could put the YouTube site in there. And that's our first dot. Because for now, we are a church. We meet together every week. There's not very many of us. I would love to see us grow. But yet, we are a church. Because we come together every week and we sing and we pray and we worship. So we can look at this and we know how this started. And then you can trace it back to your individual congregation. And then from our individual congregations, we can look at their histories. Most churches have a history that they've written down somewhere. And if they don't have it, they need to be talking to the elders in their congregation and getting one because as those older folks pass along, so will many tales that church. But each denomination or each individual congregation then has a history that it can trace through its denomination and then through back through people like Wesley and Luther and Calvin. Then we can even go back further to the early councils and creeds, the martyrs, the earliest missionaries that left Jerusalem on that day of Pentecost that we read about a little bit ago. We think of our passage of Scripture this morning as the first dot, the starting place for the church. Even though the church has deep roots in Judaism, and, and we could go from that dot and trace back from Jesus to Mary to, Joseph, to Mary and Joseph and back on through to King David and Jesse and, and Abraham and we could just keep going back. But we often consider Pentecost as the first dot for the church itself. All of the dots in between, in between lead us to where we are today. Standing in this particular instance in front of drapes in my home. In the parsonage here at Magnolia. Most congregations, though, neglect the history of the church and they neglect their own denomination's history. Oh, that could be such a wonderful study and a, an invigorating study to know about your own denomination and where it came from. We know too little of Luther and Calvin and Cranmer and Wesley and Augustine much less all of the other dots in between all those. These kinds of studies would be very good and would give us much insight as to why we believe what we believe. But today we're just for focusing on the one dot, Pentecost. Within the book of Acts, Pentecost takes place shortly after the ascension of Jesus that we talked about last week. And Though we might think of the ascension, we might think of the ascension as something spectacular and wonderful to witness, the disciples didn't quite see it that way. They kind of saw the ascension itself with mixed emotions. Uh, and I think they may have come away somewhat disappointed. They thought the resurrected Jesus would be bringing the kingdom. Uh, the kingdom back and their work would end. And in fact, if you remember, they asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time that you will restore the kingdom to Israel? They didn't realize all the gritty, dangerous, and exhausting work 
of spreading the gospel that lay ahead of them, plus that they would almost all be martyred. Then, as they stand there looking, two men who weren't part of the group in white robes were standing there and they kind of asked what, well, I'm sure the disciples kind of thought it was a dumb question. They asked them, why are you standing there looking at the sky? You know, I imagine that they wanted to say something like, well, because didn't you see it? Jesus just floated up into the sky with a cloud. That's why we're looking. But the two men told him to quit staring at the sky and to look ahead. But before the disciples became the church, they misunderstood the mission. You remember, they have one, they just haven't recalled it yet. But they misunderstood the mission and they longed for those days when Jesus was the leader and he would say, okay, go get me a donkey. How, tell me how we're going to feed these people. Go out two by two and if nobody, if people won't hear you or have anything to do with you, dust your feet and move on to someone else. Go on out and spread the gospel. But they were used to Jesus telling them what to do. You see, the two men there that day represent instruction. A word from on high to the church. Because when Jesus ascended, those people there, and I'm not just limiting it to the twelve. I feel real sure there were other disciples there. Jesus, that was a word of instruction. And they were having to be told from on high what to do. You know, the church has never done everything right. It's always needed a corrective word from heaven to know what to do next. I mean, all you've got to do is con especially continue to read Acts. When Peter doesn't want to have anything to do with the Gentiles and God says, oh, no, 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 in a dream. And talk, God takes and he blinds Paul. I mean Saul. And turns him into Paul. Takes a corrective word from heaven to know what to do next. And if the church stands around when it needs to do something else, we hope and pray that word will come from God through scripture and maybe modern day prophets. And for sure from reading the word and from prayer. You see, the disciples take care of some administrative details, and then they head on off to Jerusalem to Pentecost. By now, after they get things, kind of get their heads together, they have an idea of what they need to do, and they become excited, and they spend that whole week in the temple, and they're teaching and preaching, and then as they come back to full strength, somehow the bumbling Peter becomes the leader. We don't know how this all came about. We don't understand their game plan. But they have, or they are, coming into grips with their mission. And Jesus himself gave it to them. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You know, they consider themselves to be faithful Jews. There's nothing about being a Christian right now. They consider themselves faithful Jews, and so they attend Pentecost. Because as Jews, there are three uh, holy days that they are commanded to observe. Pentecost is one of them. It's also known as the Festival of Weeks, and it's, as I said, one of those three major festivals along with Passover and the Feast of the Tabernacles. At Pentecost, the people of God offered gratitude for the first fruits of the harvest. So they're coming in and just like, okay, David and I are excited because we've already got some tomatoes on our vines. And we can celebrate this. So for Pentecost, we would give thanks and, and offer those, God, those tomatoes to God. And we just ate some onions and some radishes from our garden the other day. Those are the first fruits. And so they have to come into Jerusalem and they're, they're thanking God for these first fruits. But 
God does something amazing. This festival becomes different because this one will be a harvest of souls. Pentecost is a harvest of souls. And those 3,000, those were the first fruits that were harvested. And that is a day to celebrate. The first fruits. And from, from those many people, oh, because of that day, that first Pentecost, we're here today celebrating another Pentecost thousands of years later. But sometimes we get discouraged with the church and we feel ready to throw in the towel. But when we do feel that way, we need to remember the rush of the Holy Spirit as Pentecost took the church completely by surprise. No one expected this to happen. No one expected that rush of the Holy Spirit. And as I told my kids in the, the children's uh, sermon, uh, it was just this huge rush of wind. And it was loud, and they couldn't understand. I'm sure they couldn't understand each other from over, over the, the noise of the wind. I'm sure it was quite loud. Think about how a fire sounds whenever it's burning. And this wind comes in and these tongues of fire settle over everyone's head. And so are you hearing the fire crackle and the wind blow at the same time? No one expected all this. So if our church attendance lags, if our influence in a community or even within our church walls seems to fizzle out, if people ignore us, let us remember that God's spirit of power came unexpectedly at Pentecost. And we never know where the next rush of wind might come from. But I will tell you this, if you're not there, you'll miss it. Let us expect the unexpected and let us expect and anticipate or hope for God's surprises. The experience at Pentecost brought unity. We mourn the divisions in, within our church. Our country is divided. It seems like the whole world is divided. Neighbor against neighbor, father against son, mother against daughter, husband against wife. But the experience at Pentecost brought unity. And while we mourn this division of our church into groups, I, you know, I've heard people say that, well, if the church was all that, why are there so many denominations? Well, because there just are. There are some things that we don't agree on. But we can all still have unity through Christ and respect each other in our differences and within our groups. With all of our disagreements over doctrine, polity, politics, social uh, issues, let us remember that the church did begin in unity with everyone hearing the right language. That's why I put the scripture on the screen for you to read as I read because I may choose different translations but we're all reading the same words at the same time. That's why many churches have one translation in the pews for their congregation to read. It may not be so much because people don't bring their Bibles to church anymore but it's so they can open it up, and read the same words. I print the words in my bulletin for my churches so that we're all reading the same one. Because not all of my churches have the same translation. And like I said, this frees me up to use different translations. 
You see, let's not discount the possibility that the spirit is going to enable liberals to hear conservatives and moderates to hear liberals or Republican Christians to hear Democrat Christians. But as it stands right now, we just all talk past each other. I can't even watch news shows with more than one person on it because they all start yelling at each other and talking over each other. Because nobody listens. Maybe the spirit, if we will open our hearts and our spirits to the spirit, maybe the spirit will enable us to hear each other once more. I hope we don't miss what happened in verse 13. With the Holy Spirit rushing through the crowd, with barriers crashing down, with God pouring energy in the disciples to become the church, a few cynics sneered at the whole thing. They're filled with new wine. Those people found it more uh, believable to think that everybody, the whole crowd, was drunk that morning rather than believe that God was working through them with the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the people that were there were Jews. So they were there for God. But rather than believing God was working through these people, oh no, they're just drunk. So if people today dismiss the church, ridicule it, poke fun at it, we've got to remember that these attitudes go back as far as the first day the church came together with the Holy Spirit. Back to that first dot. People have always made fun of the church. They will always make fun of the church. But our faith must be stronger. I don't believe anyone today accuses the church of a drunken stupor every Sunday morning, but they do make other accusations. They say that it's boring, irrelevant, out of touch, self-righteous. No one who has hung around a church for very long can dispute those charges. We've all experienced the boredom of an ill-prepared sermon or a long meeting, the silliness or the viciousness of a church feud, and you could probably add a lot more to that, but we can also see power behind the church. We see children learning about God learning about Jesus and learning to find their way through his word, learning the faith. We see the sacrifices of people pulling things together to make sure that worship happens every Sunday morning. You see, we see the inspiration that carries people through from crisis to crisis. And we see mission work around the world. Oh, we can scoff and we can sneer at church all the time and feel a little snug, a little holier than thou. You know, I, I think one thing that really bothers me is when I hear someone say that the church is just full of hypocrites. Well... I could say some trite things, but I believe everybody is a hypocrite at times. And I don't want to be the one judging someone else that's sitting there in that body of believers. So if you think the church is filled with hypocrites... Maybe you need to rethink it. Because everyone can have a hypocritical spirit. And we all need to be praying that God takes that spirit from us. Oh, in our smugness, we can say we don't need the church. 
We can say we can worship God out in the woods. I've said it. And I've given God some passing thoughts while I was out in the woods. But very little worship happened there. You see, we can sneer and we can protect ourselves from the danger of the Holy Spirit. But those who dismissed the early church as a bunch of drunks kept themselves safe. You see, they didn't face the jail cells or the crosses or the angry mobs. None of them were flogged for what happened that day. But those who dismissed the church as a bunch of drunks also dismissed the joy, the faith, and the love of the early church. They missed the bold encounters with the world. They missed the courage of the missionaries, the faithfulness of Stephen. They missed the shock of seeing Paul transformed from an angry bully to a loving brother in Christ. Even though the Spirit came to the church in an overwhelming way, the church still needed faith to see what happened as the work of the Spirit. It was only when Peter leapt up and he connected the dots back to Joel, which would speak to those Jews who had not been following Jesus, when he connected them to the prophet Joel, did the church understand what they experienced. Oh, we might feel a tingle as we walk in the woods on a Sunday morning. But the church helps us interpret that tingle. So I ask now, does God still work power through the church? Do we still have relevant ministry to do in this broken world? What pulls you to this broadcast. I'm going to ask you to share this with someone today. Share it on your Facebook page. See if you can get someone else to at least talk about it. You know, can we dismiss the work of the church as unimportant? I think that we need to see how the Spirit still empowers the church. And remember, I called us a church this morning. So let us act generously in a greedy world. Let us show courage in the midst of fear. And let us claim hope when others give up. Let us go out in the power of the Spirit to bear witness to the transforming work of the resurrection. It is in the name of the resurrected Christ. Amen.
Now would you receive this benediction? God, out of His great love, has created you. Jesus Christ, out of His great love, has redeemed you. The Holy Spirit, out of great love, has lifted and inspired you to go in peace and service throughout God's world, proclaiming the good news of peace, love, hope, and joy to all. Go in peace. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.